Hey guys, how are you doing? This is Zeb from Zed Outdoors. I hope you're having an awesome day. So today, we have a stranger in the midst. It won't be a stranger to a lot of you if you've been watching my channel for a long period of time. Lee, stop on Lee, how are you doing? Good to see you again, Zed. It's been you, a while. You too as well. We're in his abode. Now technically we would be filming outside, but the weather's a bit temperamental at the moment in the UK. What would it be in the UK? So we were in his man cave, and um, it's been a while, actually, yes, hasn't it? it? Too long. Yeah, it's been long. ages. Yeah. I think the last time we were filming in here was roughly about two years ago. And we filmed ago. now, which is a very famous spoon carving video, <laughs> um, that was shot pretty much off the cuff. Um, and it has been an incredibly well-received video. Uh, one of the most common questions I get asked is, when are you going to have Lee back on your channel? I've been bugging him for ages. He's a busy man. He's an important guy nowadays, you know. Yeah, Ain't got time for little guys like me anymore. <laughs> <laughs> always, always. No, no, I'm joking. No, Lee, we've been keeping in touch for a long time, but like I said, we just it just hasn't really kind of been compatible in terms of logistics up until today. So it's good to see you again. And stuff. How you been keeping? Everything yeah. good? Yeah, can't complain. Been busy. Excellent so, stuff. Yeah, it's all good. I see, scorps in high demand now, yeah, I tell you. Yeah. They're like a jackal knife now. <laughs> they go up on the website, boom, gone. Trying to keep up. I know, I know, no, 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 but his work's going from leaps to bounds. Rewind back if you haven't seen it already. I've done a video with Lee, like I've just mentioned about two years ago, on how to carve a spoon. It has been an incredibly well received video. Needless to say, I would have put a link to that down below in the description, so be sure to go and check that out in your own time. So, today I'm with Lee to cover a topic that I've been meaning to learn about myself for quite a while, and I know Lee is very capable of doing it in many different ways, and that is putting a handle on a knife blank. Now, this is where you can kind of interject here slightly. So, from my understanding, there are certain knife blanks that you can buy off the market. Yeah. For example, you can buy the more uh, mass-produced ones, such as the Mora blanks, uh, that, as in they don't have the handle, but it's the actual knife itself. And you can go then all the way to kind of the high-end specialists uh, and renowned people like Nick Westerman, who's a very renowned British blacksmith and bladesmith and tool maker. Because when Nick makes the tools, uh, he doesn't make the handle, does he? No, he just sells the blades, generally. Just sells the blades and sends them to you. And I've always wondered how you actually put a handle on there. Now, needless to say, it's like knife making. You can start off from something very, very basic and go to something incredibly detailed and involves a lot of craftsmanship and skill. The goal with this video is to keep it as simple as possible that you, at home, with some basic tools, can do yourself using some very basic equipment that you may have already access to at hand. Um, and so with the knife blanks, am I right in saying that obviously in some of what we're talking about off camera and obviously we'll be talking about now on camera, that Putting a handle on a knife blank really depends on the type of blank that you get. Absolutely, yeah. The technique is going to vary dependent on the shape of the tank, basically. Right. Um, and then the method comes down to really how neat you want it to look in the end product. Mm -hmm. You could go to down the full custom knife route where you're going to make a metal bolster that slides onto the tank and gives an exact fit around the tank so you don't see any the way it's fitted and then you can have whatever's behind that to secure it to the, right. the main body of the handle but you're basically trimming it which is what Mora do. You know, they've got a fairly short, sort of four inch handle. It's, if you strip it down, there's a whacking great big hole through it that takes quite a wide tang, um, but then it's secured on one end with a roll pin. So this is an example of that. I've got this, this is a, a rough blade that I've forged at the- We'll do a close up. In, but we'll do a in close up a photograph of this. But it's basically, uh, th this roll pin here enables for this to have a handle that the tang goes all the way through, like on a Mora, so you're going to drill a hole that's going to accept all of this tang, but you know, be a slightly loose fit. Then it goes all the way through. This roll pin then gets secured into the end of the handle, and this piece of the tang just pinned over the end to gotcha. make it like a mushroom to, to lock it in place. And it's an entirely mechanical fixing. There's no need for glue. But what you do need, ideally, is something up the front end to cover up this dirty great big hole that you've made for the tang to fit in fairly loosely. So what Mora's solution is, you probably notice they've got like a little metal ferrule that mm -hmm. wraps around the front of the blade, it fits quite tightly to the blade, quite tightly to the handle and covers up the big ugly hole that's behind it basically. And then this bit here is really what locks that in because the, the, the knife's going all the way through the handle and being held in physically at the end. Um, that's a kind of a, a factory process and there's nothing to stop us replicating that in something that we've made but you're going to need a knife with a fairly long tang that's going to protrude all the way through your handle. A lot of makers will make blades with a, a shorter tang. So this is a finished blade um, and it's ready for a handle. Now the handle is probably going to be longer than the tang 
Mm -hmm. So if we're thinking about putting this in a hand, we could just drill a hole that's about the same size as the, as the, the part of the tank that's nearest the, nearest the blade. And obviously it's, it's flatter in this dimension than it is in this dimension. But we can take a nominal figure and make a hole that's enough to accept most of the tang and then either just open up the end of that hole so it drops in but then secure it with a glue like an epoxy resin that's quite a common way of doing it and that's how um, it's probably easiest to deal with most of Nick's blades is that you know the tangs are not super long so they're going to protrude all the way through the handle so you're going to drill a hole that's a bit oversized and fill it with glue if if the hole's really oversized you could use a dowel um, much like this this is a, a a method that Nick details on his website in one of his blog posts so you're basically going to cut a slot into a piece of dowel you can then drill a hole into your handle blank that this dowel fits in exactly mm -hmm. and then the actual tang of the blade fits inside the slot in the dowel to secure it so it means that on the end of the handle you've got quite a nice clean finish and you can glue the dowel in in advance as long as you make sure the knife tang is going to fit properly inside it this tang is a bit tight in this dowel so it's spreading it apart you want that to be a fairly loose fit but it then turns a round hole into a slot effectively and you can cut this with a saw in advance. That's one method, it's not what we're going to look at today because like I said this tang's a bit on the fat side because it's almost a square tang mm -hmm. as opposed to a flat tang. On the Mora blades they're a fairly flat sort of like two and a half mil thick blade so there's nothing to stop you to get like a 12 mil dowel, basically cut it in half and then shave the thickness of the tang out of that dowel and put that into your knife blank, your knife handle blank before you then shape it and then just glue the blade in at the end and know it's all in alignment. Yeah, I think what we'll do, let's do this, I'll jump behind the camera, Yeah. Um, we'll do a close up of the two blades we're going to be working with yeah. um, and then we'll focus on the one technique first and then we'll look at a second technique afterwards, if that's okay with you. It suits me. So let's do that, let me jump behind the camera and we'll get started. So Lee, this is the knife we're going to be starting with. Yeah, for the first demonstration. We're going to okay. start it really simple. So this is basically a blade that started off from round bar stock. It's a little coal roasting blade. So it started off with six mil round silver steel. I've just ground the edges flat for a couple of reasons. Partly it gives me a reference to set it on a on a table to grind the grind the bevels in. But also, when we come to gluing this in, it gives enough space for some of the glue to escape past the flat. So you're not creating a if you fill a fill a hole full of glue and then push this in you're going to push air in as well and it's going to actually want to push it, you're going to put pressure in a bit like a fire piston and it's going to want to push the blade back out. So having those flats on the side just enables the glue to creep out as well. So it's, a, yeah, it's fairly functional. But this is made from silver steel, which is a fairly readily available knife steel. Um, other people make similar blades out of high speed steel. So the same drill they make, um, same steel they make drills out of and you can buy it pre-hardened. So you don't necessarily, this has been heat treated um, you can actually just buy the heat, the HSS steel that's already heat treated and all you've got to do is then grind the bevel on and stick it in your handle. So I thought this is a simple project that most people can tackle even making the blade themselves. Um, so we, you know without heat basically without a forge. So but this is one that I've actually has been been heat treated because it doesn't come as a preheated heat treated material. So this is what we're aiming to make. So that's the blade set into a handle. And you can see all the, the handles actually carved. Now the material we're going to start with for this is just some dowel. So this is some dowel that I've turned from some wood that I've harvested. It's London plain and it's got a little bit of spalting on it so it's quite attractive. You could just start with some simple shop bought dowel. This is um, just beach dowel bought from a kind of a hardware shop. Or actually in fact this one was a, an old stair gate that I stripped down. Gotcha. <laughs> so you know if you've got things like that, that you're going to throw in a skip think about it before you chuck them away because this can be useful stuff. This is actually what I make the pegs for the scorp boxes mm -hmm. out of the blade boxes. That's the little retaining peg all gets turned out of this dowling. So that's a fairly readily available material. You haven't got to have a lathe to produce it keeping it simple as possible. Now to make sure that we get the blade in line into this handle. It's no good drilling a hole so it pokes out the side. We've got to try and drill a nice straight hole in this, which is the first job really. So what we want to do, so I know what size this material is, but let's for example say we don't know. So we're going to measure it at its widest point and it's going to come up just under six millimeters. If I hold that out, you've got 5.93. So we know if we drill a six meter hole, six millimeter hole, this is going to fit in it snugly, but not too baggy. Mm -hmm. So 
The first thing I'm going to do though is because this is a fairly slim dowel, I mean we can double check that, probably around 18 millimeters I guess, 19, not a bad guess. So if I try and drill the, the 6 mil hole straight into it and I don't get it just right, I've got no chance to correct it. So what I'm going to actually start with is a 3 mil drill just to pilot the hole into this. And the reason this is over length is I want to drill in from one end to house the tang and then from the other end to make this little cap up to cover the sharp point of the blade while it's in transit. So to begin with, I'm going to just fit a 3 mil drill into just a simple hand drill, just a battery powered cordless drill. There's a 3 mil drill there. So we're just going to put that in. Now this is probably going to be possible to drill this to the full depth that we need. We're going to want about an inch of spine protruding here so you've got the, the thumb rest facility that you want on a coal roasting knife. So you place the drill bit um, at the length you want the... Basically in this case I can so I can drill that hole to the full depth and know that if I work away up to the jaws of the chuck it's not going to go too deep. Mm -hmm. So I can do it like that. If the drill was much longer I might want to mask it off just use a bit of masking tape to mark the length but that's fine. Um, this has been turned on a lathe so it's actually got a centre point already marked on it if it didn't have, I would recommend finding the centre of the, of, the, of the dowel and then marking it somehow. So you could use um, something like a simple gimlet here and you could just do it by eye. You know, you pick roughly the middle, put a little mark there and think, yeah, that looks about right. And then just give it a little twist just to give yourself somewhere for the drill to start. Because we're drilling into end grain, it's quite likely that the drill is going to want to be lead as it goes in. So having that starting point isn't a bad shout. Now for this one we've already got the centre point mark from where it's been turned on the lathe and I'm going to, for this bit I'm going to pop it in a vise. You don't have to do this but it means I've got a good chance I can look at it start the drill here and I can see in the mirror that I'm vertical that way by just keeping an eye on the mirror and I can see that the drill's lining up with a dowel because I'm standing to the side of it here I can see this way that I'm in fairly good alignment so it's a case of two mirrors could help you could use something like a square to help guide you you know just to give you a rough idea of what you're aiming for there's different ways that you can aim this or you could use a friend to say yeah if you're, you're straight go for it so in order to make sure you want to make sure you have a friend basically it's, it's, you can't it's, be, you can't be a loner no yeah you know if you haven't got a friend, a mirror's not bad company. I'll say, so, you can talk to each other. <laughs> so I'm lining that up in the mirror there. I'm lining it up this way. And I'm just going to start, go a little way. Try and keep it nice and straight. Just check my mirror again. And I'm going to drill that. Try and keep it straight. Bring the drill out every now and again just to get rid of any, any waste that's building up because that's what will help to create friction and lead the drill in the wrong direction. Just trying to keep that straight. And then if you've got that pretty good, Go full depth. You can see just lose this swarf that's coming out. And we're back, we're up to the chuck now. So we can take that out of there. And what we hope is that if we've gone fairly straight and we put that on the drill, oh look we haven't. So you see that's gone really wobbly. Yeah. Alright. So there's not a huge amount we can do about that with this drill. I can try and correct it and work out where it's going and try and get this to run straight. So if that's high, bring the drill out, drop it down a little bit and then go in at a different angle and try and get this to run a bit straighter. And this is why we started with a small drill, so we've got half a chance to correct it. Now what's happened here is I think possibly the spalting in this wood has enabled there to be a little bit of weakness. It's pulled the drill off in one direction as it's gone in. And this is the problem with drilling into end grain. So I think what we're going to do, that's a bit beyond what I'm happy with. So we'll perhaps have another go at it from this end, and I'm going to try it freehand this time. So I'm going to just start the drill on that centre point and when I get so far in just let this rotate in my hand. See that's a bit straighter now but it's not quite right so a bit of a correction. That's running a lot truer now. See, that's almost perfectly true. I'm quite happy with that. So just gently does it making sure we lose that waste. That waste can be what makes the difference. See, now we're pretty straight. We'll go full depth on that, and this will be the end 
that we're going to use to put the blade in. This end, we can still open it up and make the hole for the um, to stick the blade in. So gotcha. that's that's not the end of the world. What I will just do is take that measurement there. So we know that the hole's that deep at this point in time. So whatever we need, we're going to cut this end off first so that we've not got a hole all the way through it. So we've got a solid end in it. So that's where the hole is to now. This hole, we can see it's nicely centered. So you can see it goes wrong. You know, there is no guaranteed way mm. of drilling a straight hole in a piece of dowel. But the beauty of it is we've started with a small hole, which we can now open up and we've got it straight before we're going to open it up. So I'm just going to change the drill over now to a six mil. Okay, so you've got the new drill bit on. Yeah, they've now changed this over for a six mil. So just going to carefully now holding this, obviously there is the potential to slip out and drill into your hand. So I wouldn't necessarily recommend this, but if you hold it a little bit further away, it's not a bad idea. And as long as you start gently, make sure the drill's biting in the end a little bit. Just make sure it's still rotating nice and, nice and true. Then just clamp up on the dowel. Get rid of the, getting rid of that waste is really important. Now, what we didn't do was double check the measurement, but can you see we've got a little bit of that's a little bit of worm frass there. So that's where a woodworm's been in this piece of wood. So I'm going to want to trim that back. So I actually want this hole to be slightly deeper than it was. So if we say that we want that much blade to be poking out, mm -hmm. we actually want that to come back to this point here. So I'm going to put a mark there where we're going to end up trimming back to and then we want it to come to there. Okay, so that's where we want the hole to end is the end of the tang so that when we push that blade in it hits the wood at the end. It can't gotcha. then slip back into the handle any further. So what I want to do is just make sure that when I get to there I then pull that drill out and check and we're nearly there look. Okay, another couple of millimetres and where the depth we want to be. So I can just put this into where it's it naturally kind of hits the end of the hole there and I'm just going to judge this by eye a couple of extra millimetres will give us the extra the hole depth that we need so if you wanted to you could literally measure the blade against the tang and just wrap a bit of masking tape around the blade around the drill bit sorry just to give you the depth that you're after it's not essential um, now we should find that that fairly comfortable it starts to, it's tight you see it's not I can't really push that all the way in with my mm -hmm. fingers but we can clamp this in a vise and tap it on when we put a bit of glue in the hole so mostly it's going to be a mechanical fit the glue is probably a bit surplus to requirements but it's going to stop the blade from twisting this is a knife that you're going to twist in a cut so we want it to we don't want the blade to stay still while you're twisting the handle so in a lot of cases the glue is just going to basically be to stop it twisting but I'm going to leave this little bit of extra on here and cut that off at a later stage but we just want to remember that we're taking this 10 mil off the end this end now we can open up um, but we want to really this is going to be the lid isn't it this will basically be the little cap to cover the blade so again we're going to open this up we know that the six mils are reasonably tight fit so we're going to open that up to six mil and that will just be a friction fit we could if we wanted to in fact we will just to be sure because i've got one i'm going to open the hole up first to five and a half millimeters and then what I will do is just the very start of it go to six. But what I want to do first is just check the depth again. Because we started drilling that out for the, the, the tang of the blade, it's deeper than it needs to be. So I'm just going to push the three mil drill bit until it hits the end. And we've already marked it on there. So we know it's to there to just double check it's to that pencil line. And we're going to have about an inch of this blade coming out. And then we're going to want a solid section. So if that's where the hole is already, we can, there's the five and a half drill. So just to show you the masking tape method, we don't want to go any deeper than that. Okay, so I'm just going to grab a bit of masking tape and wrap it around there. So you don't need a lot, just an inch of masking tape where my fingernail is. Just wrap that around the drill. You can get little collars that fit on drills, but a bit of masking tape is quick and easy. Pop that in the drill. And in we go again. See, I've just hit the bottom of that hole. Out we come. And you can see that that drill's been led off centre for some reason. 
and it'll be a weakness in the timber somewhere but we can correct that in the carving that's why we started with an oversized dowel see that doesn't want to fit now mm -hmm. that's tight but when you think we got this taper on the blade at full depth we don't mind that biting a little bit so now i'm going to take that one out put the six mil one in and then just open up the front of the hole not to the full depth but just so that this will go and then when it gets all the way in it'll bite and it'll be quite tight okay so technically now we can allow a little bit extra and release this because we don't need this bit anymore but bearing in mind we're going to carve flats on it we might as well leave it all in one piece for now because it's going to be that's going to be really difficult to hold on to to carve which mm -hmm. is why i started with a longer dowel if you just add a couple of inches to hold on to you're much closer to your fingers when you're carving it so keeping it simple leave it all in one piece for now we know that our hand we know that that's going to go into there we're going to trim that back we know using this as an example if we take the handle length from that line our overall handle length is going to be to about there if we're making a, a rough copy of that and you can see we've got a fair amount of material that we can lose in the in the width yeah so a couple of ways we can do that why not just start with a knife really probably worth just trimming that bit off now because we're going to end up carving our mark off so these are quite useful little gadgets this is just got a bench hook so you can put it on the side of your bench you can if need be lock it into your vice if you're sawing with a, a saw that cuts on the push you're pushing it up against this backstop i generally prefer to use a japanese saw so i can just hold it against the backstop and trim that to length you can see the hole's nice and centered and we can give ourselves a rough idea that we're going to want to now knock some flats on here so we've got to start on one side we could potentially plane it we could um so essentially at this stage you're thinking about the the the, the, the shape the, the shape, shape that really the, handle's the handle's going to be we know that now that this will accept this blade it will drop into the right depth where we've put that mark all we've got to do is put a drop of glue in there first tap it on so the point being is if we'd have carved this handle first to this quite thin dimensions you're going to either hold this like a pen or a pencil really or you're going to use it like this and push it like pivot off your thumb but it's not a knife that you're going to grip like that mm -hmm. so it doesn't need to be a big bulky handle if we can you imagine trying to get that six mil drill to run centrally down that thin section of material yeah. it's just not going to happen this is about as thin as i'd like to start for a handle like this because then if it does wander a little bit we've got the potential to correct it because we've got plenty of material around it so there's different ways we can go about carrying on now we can carve it just the, the easiest way it's a bit overkill really we could use an axe to start trimming some flats mm. on this in reality what's wrong with just using a normal carving knife so now the shaping of the handle Lee yeah so we're going to start with the so I think the best place to start is probably just going to be to keep things simple just do it with a carving knife so just a normal sloyd knife straight carving knife whatever you want to call it and I'm going to try and first of all establish one flat surface to give me a bit of a reference so a chest lever cut is going to be quite good for that because I can just progress that cut off the end with a fair bit of power it doesn't have to be particularly neat at this stage but what I want to do is try and keep that flat in one plane so if we look down the end of it we want that to be parallel hopefully all the way along and I'm just gonna to have to wire that up sometimes the easiest way I find to do that is to work off the side of my leg here and actually pull the knife towards me so I can look straight down it as I'm carving I can eye it up all the way down and as long as the I'm you know I'm only keeping this quite tight into my body so I'm not gonna there's no big power cuts going on but I can then you can see obviously this is seasoned wood it doesn't have to be in fact if you started with green timber you're going to find that it's going to be slightly more difficult to keep the hole straight probably when you're drilling it but what you might also find is it's going to be slightly easier to carve and also you won't really need the glue because the hole will shrink around the tang of the blade but to start with i'm just now making an opposite face parallel and it's not quite there yet but so i'm just keeping an eye on it because we're effectively going from round to square and then going to knock some extra facets off of that so it's probably best 
I'm not using the knife actually in between my legs, I'm using my leg a bit like a bench and I'm pulling the, the work past the blade. Some people will do it off the front of their knee. Probably technically a bit safer to come off the side of your leg to do this. And we're going to come up like this and just try and keep these lines fairly parallel. You want to be trying to work with the grain wherever possible and you'll find that with a knife if it's not if it's starting to lift and dig in you're not working with the grain. But you can see now we've got two flats hopefully established on the side there. Not quite on the pencil lines but they're parallel with each other that's the important factor. And then we might want to start thinking about taking two more flats which are going to run this round thing into square. Now technically you might quite like the idea of keeping some of the shape of the dowel in it. It's entirely up to you but it's got to be comfortable that's the important thing. So you, this carving stage really is going to be down to what you think is going to be best for you. So just to start this off I'm going to come up see that's digging in now so you see that's that's gone against the grain so I need to come back the other way this way. So I'm going to come up and I'm bracing this against my chest because that's another grip that I quite like. It means I can't tell how perpendicular to this cut I am really apart from the fact that if this is if this is horizontal and I keep the knife vertical in theory they're going to end up perpendicular aren't they. So I'm going to come this way and again because I'm carving with the knife angled away from me coming back towards my body is not a problem because my wrist is going to hit my body before the knife can and act as a natural stop there. So just square this end up so we've got it all the way. So as soon as you this stage you're squaring off all I'm the basically side. turning the round into a square, yeah. So there's nothing to stop you starting with a square piece of timber if that's what you've got. It's just that the dowel stock is fairly readily available if that's where you want to go. So there is no rules you could start with a piece of timber that was 18mm square rather than 18mm round. This just happens to be what I've got kicking about and it's quite a convenient place to start. You could also, if you wanted to, if you've got a lathe, you don't have to carve this at all. You could turn the handle and in fact there's an example just there, or a couple in fact. They're kind of turned versions of the same thing but obviously you're going to need a lathe for that and a pole lathe probably isn't going to be the ideal solution because it's very fine work. So mm -hmm. it's, you know, you're probably going to break this on a pole lathe. So you need, you're ideally going to need an electric lathe to do something like that. But they're just a couple of samples, ideas. I personally prefer faceted handles. So that's what we're going to make in this case. So we're getting almost to square now. And then when we've gone square, we're actually going to finish this off as an octagon. And what I'd quite like is to taper it. A tiny bit more of that. See, that's that wormhole again we've come across. So that's soft, that's almost powder there. So we want to be carving past that and hope we can lose it. If not, if you can't get rid of it altogether, if you get that sort of thing in timber, what the best thing I've found is to get a really thin super glue mm -hmm. and just put a couple of drops on it, and it'll soak in and then basically turn that back into solid wood. Um, it's not ideal, but if you want to rescue a piece that you've been working with and you've already invested some time in it, that's normally the best way of achieving that, I've found. So we've got to come all the way back to the where the end of the handle is going to be. That's the little mark there. So as long as I go just beyond that, we're good. And then we can think about now, this end again, where we're off centre while we're at it and we've got the extra bit of wood to hold on to, if we put a line there, take a similar distance here, and it, so we're going to basically carve more off of this side and off of that side and that will put that hole basically back in the centre of the piece that we've got left. So hopefully, come at it from that direction. Chest lever cut gives you all this power which I like. And we'll work down to that line. And this is the lid that essentially was shaping up. Yeah, the basically, yeah. So it'll just be basically run in line with the handle. We might make it slightly bigger than the handle if the timber allows. But we're just keeping it simple at this stage, really. And I'm not rushing this. You could, you know, you could 
really work quite quickly if need be, but we're not in a hurry. So again, now I've almost got that hole back in the middle from that dimension. A couple more shavings off of there. So that's about back in the centre now. So now I can think about just making some lines parallel to that. Sorry, perpendicular to that even. And coming off of there and we're going to turn this So Lee, you've been refining the facets then? Yeah, just a little bit. I've got the octagon, octagonal shape that I want on this end here, and you see it's slightly tapering towards where the blade will be. So this is where the end of the handle is going to be. So now I kind of want to work back towards this. So I'm going to put just a couple of little reference cuts, just to give me an idea where I'm working to, because we'll soon carve the pencil line out, and this end wants to be tapered to not quite a point, but slightly more slender fit mostly for aesthetic reasons rather than so I'm just using a series of V cuts to give me a mark around there and then taking kind of here as the widest point I'm going to try and taper this back to this end now where these marks are will be the end of the handle that's going to be the end of the cap for the blade so this bit in the middle is just waste so I don't have to worry about cutting into that and I'm just going to take a cut rotate and then take a cut from the next facet and hopefully that will just start coming down in a fairly uniform way. I'm going a little bit against the grain there by the feel and the sound of it but just for getting waste off it's not going to be too much of an issue. The knife's nice and sharp. So we're just essentially we're coming back to that principle of shaping it to the way you, you want it to feel in your hand. Basically yeah I mean I know I'm no expert on co rosin by any chance I've just made these knives so I can have a play with it. This is what I'm using so this is roughly what we're aiming for. You see, I've still got a little way to go, but this seems pretty comfortable to me. Um, you know, you might disagree when you've been using it for six months and have a load of blisters, but I'd say it's not something I can profess to be any kind of expert on. Some people seem to like to have these swellings and a bit of a, a dip there. I don't, again, I don't really understand that, whether it's just an aesthetic thing or a function thing, because it's not something I've had a massive amount of experience with. But what I can say is the knife that I've made myself and had a little bit of a play with seems to work okay so we're basically going to roughly mimic that so I'm just going to carry on and taper this down now until we're at a point where we can basically separate the two parts and then fit the blade so I'll carry on with that it's going to it's not going to be particularly exciting but I can film a little bit more of it just got to work with the grain here so I'm going to, if necessary I'm going to start at the end that's going to be the slimmest and work up towards here you just got to find the way the grain, you know, you'll feel if you're working against the grain and you just want to try and not do that basically. So if I need to come behind that point to get in, you see I'm using these fingers to kind of drive the blade. It's a short stroke but you can put a bit of extra power into it just to reduce that right at that point. And while I'm, while I'm holding it like this and I know that I am working with the grain, then I'll stick with it for now. See that's starting to dig in now so it wants to come back the other way. But what we could do once we've got some of this waste off, if you've got one and you want to give it a bit of a try, you could use a small hand plane like a block plane mm -hmm. or a little luthier's plane to actually really refine these facets so where you're going to get them reasonably straight with the knife you're going to get them dead flat and straight with a, with a plane. You could use a spoke shave if you've got a method of clamping the, clamping the piece. So there's all sorts of tools, but in order just to keep it as simple as possible, it's not bad practice to, to carve you know, squares and octagons and things with your, with your knife. It comes in handy practice for spoon handles and things like that. So to have the control to put these facets on just with a knife is not a bad thing to practice. So we just keep working at it until it's where we want it. But so if you wanted to refine it so they were dead straight and flat and level, you could use a hand plane. So Lee, a lot of that's shaped up now. Maybe yeah, just tidying off the ends. Pretty right? much all shaped up to how we want it. I'm just going to trim up these ends. So I'm going to start by just taking a, a peeling cut. So like we're peeling a potato or an apple, and just knock these corner corners back. So we've got a bit of a bevel. 
And once again, this is the end that the knife is going to go. This through. is the end that the blade is going to fit in. And what, what we will do is flip it over. See, I've roughly shaped the blade cover. So that just needs a little bit of tweaking here and there, tidying up. But the beauty of this is what we can actually do is when this is fitted on the blade, we can tidy it up a little bit. So we don't need to be super neat with it now, but let's just clean these faces up a little bit. So as a reminder, you've essentially it intentionally kept it as one long piece in order to make it easier to carve. Yeah, because you can see I've got this bit to hold on to while I'm carving this bit. Can you imagine if I was just trying to hold on to that and carve it? Yeah. It's going to be virtually impossible. Now, I'm not saying it has to be part of the same dowel, but, if it's but it wants to be longer than it's going to end up, basically. So you've got something to hold on to to work it. So we've got this end here again. It's going to take... See, by carving a bit more off one side than the other, we've centred the hole up again. So even though it was... We knew it, the drill was led off centre. It's going to come around and just knock these back to bevels. And then just to clean up the end grain, we're from a saw cut, just generally going to run it round here. And I'm turning the billet and just using my thumb as an anchor to keep it in place. So same on this end, just to trim that just literally just to tidy up that end grain, make it a nice clean cut. Okay, so that looks pretty decent. So now this bit here, if we're gonna work off of it being the same length as this one, we're gonna to come to there, we're gonna to come to there. So this bit in the middle is now waste. So we can saw that off now um, and then tidy up this end and this end. So I'm just gonna make sure Put the right length which is to there put a little mark on we've already got a mark here which i cut in so back to the bench hook again i find these little japanese saws are really quite quite useful things hopefully we've not got a hole in the end which is good Right, so we've got our two bits now. So you can see we've got a reasonably sensible octagonal section on there, but it's not perfect. So just trim that off to make it nice. And about the same, just a couple of cuts really. That facet just wants a tiny little bit off of it. Okay, and then I'm going to do exactly the same thing just to make this a bit more comfortable. You just come off and take these facets off again. You just do one at a time and work your way round. Just going to make it a bit more comfortable to hang on to, really. And we could even round it all, round it all over, but just, I mean, those saws cut pretty fine, but the knife's going to cut cleaner than the saw. So just on that end grain again, just work our way round. If you really wanted to make this sort of super comfy, if you like, we're not going to be... This isn't going to be digging into our palm or used for anything. You see on that one I've just done the same sort of thing, just rounded the end over a little bit. Just to clean it up and neaten it up really. So that's comfortable to hold on to. It will take the blade as deep as we want it to. Now I'm going to try and line up, just from the aesthetic point of view, pick the two biggest flats and line up the flat section of the blade with those but also keep in mind that if the hole did get led astray we want to line it up so that the blade is going to run in line with the handle with the cutting edge so that orientation there is quite good Can you see that's running nice and straight mm -hmm. if I twist it round you see the blades very slightly pointing off to one side because gotcha. even, even though we made sure the hole was nice and straight in the beginning now we've hand carved this there's potential that bits are going to come off of places slightly unevenly. We can't see the hole deep inside there, so we've just got to kind of go by eye a little bit. So what I'm going to do is make sure that I can push this in a reasonable distance, twist this blade around until it's looking nice and straight in line with the handle, which... I'd say about there is quite good in line. So then what I'm going to do is just follow it back from the tip of the blade and just put a little pencil mark 
so I know that that's the orientation when I've got the glue in there and I'm going to be in, not in a massive hurry but I want to be able to line this up with the spine of the blade so we know now that that's going to cut straight looking down from both sides so that will be orientated correctly and we're ready for some glue So Lee, what's the next phase? Well, the next stage we're just gonna we're about to glue this the blade into the handle, but what we want to make sure is that the metal part that's gonna stick to the handle is not greasy or oily in any way. Now blades quite often will be. Oily. Is that because wait, it interferes with the glue? Or? Yeah, basically, if this has got an oily residue on it, the glue's not gonna stick to the metal very well. The fact that it's got this kind of fairly rough ground surface in it is good because it provides a bit of a key. So all I've got here. This is actually a um, brake and clutch cleaner. Um, any alcohol would do. Um, what vodka? So, yeah, Martini. vodka. Surgical spirit or yeah, out of push vodka would actually do the job. So if need be, raid the drinks cabinet. But realistically, say so this is a, a reasonably cheap and effective way of doing it. Um, I degrease a fair bit, a fair few blades. So I just tend to buy this stuff like five liters at a time. It's perfect for the job because it's designed to clean the the film and the skin off of a brake disc when it's new. So I'm just going to use a bit of dry kitchen towel. Normally you feel that's nice and cold, but can you see that yes. bit of residue that's come off? So it's, it's a good chance that even if that's not oil, it's loose particles that are stuck to the surface of the metal. So we just want to make sure we get rid of any of that. And make While sure you're doing that, uh, one thing I know, it's obviously you're, you're being extremely careful about this, but uh, obviously you have the blade edge. Would it be an idea for someone maybe to tape that up? Or Absolutely, yeah. I've just been very careful how I hold it. You're right in what you're saying. The, the reason I'm obviously holding the blade is because my fingers are going to, my skin's going to have a, a little bit of grease involved. Yep. So I'm holding the, the blade. You, you're quite right. A bit of masking tape around it would definitely be beneficial. Um, but I'm going to make sure that I don't touch that tang again because I don't want to transfer any grease off my fingers. So yeah, I was just careful how I pinched that so that the point wasn't going to dig into me. But that blade's now degreased, I'm happy with that. And I'm just going to use some fairly quick setting epoxy here. You can get stuff that takes like 24 hours to set. This is only a five minute one and it's, so to say, all it's going to do is stop the blade from rotating. So you just want an even amount of each. And we're not going to use a lot here. So any decent two, two, yeah, two decent part epoxy. Yeah, decent two part epoxy. Super glue is not really going to do the trick. But we're just going to want a little drop of each. Just like that, because we've only got a tiny amount of space to fill with it, really. But it wants to be an even amount of each, or it's not going to work properly. And then all this is is just a little bit of a bamboo skewer. Make sure you give it a good mix together, and it'll go kind of cloudy when that's mixed. We're ready to go. So you see, it'll basically it'll go a slightly cloudy colour when it's mixed. And we're just going to scoop it up on the end of the stick, twizzle it around a bit like honey. And just let a drop of it go in the end of the hole there. Don't need loads. So just letting it drop in, yeah? Yeah, and let gravity do the work really. So hold the, hold the handle upright and let that drop down. And we're just going to grab a bit more while it's nice and liquid. Just drop that in. And it helps if the stick that you're using is slightly smaller than the hole that you're putting it in. Not it's a story of my life. <laughs> so, you've got that little dollop on the end, and if it comes to it, if it doesn't all run off, because it does take a while to move, you can see it's fairly, fairly thick liquid. But if it does get to the point where it's dropped in most of it, you can just put it in and then just scrape the rest of it off on the side. But it's like we don't need loads of the stuff. It's just basically the, the tang is almost going to fill the hole, so the, all the glue's got to do. We know the hole's not overly deep, and if we've judged this right. Hopefully we should just have a tiny little bit of glue push out as we push the blade in. So that's that. What we're then going to want to do is carefully pick up this blade by the sharp bit. Um, and actually what I'm going to do is hold it with the paper towel while I set this part into this little vise. Now metal jawed vise should be fine for this. We're just going to grip the cheeks where there's some flats on so the point's completely covered. I can't cut myself on it and more importantly I'm not going to damage the blade. Nip that up nice and tight. If it was another knife, what would you put, like a piece of leather to... to yeah, you could it? use... Um, I've got a piece of leather, funny enough, somewhere that goes in there. But you, as long as it's hard metal, the vice jaws shouldn't mark it. Now see, there's my there's my mark. And so technically, I'd have been better off flipping this round because then I can see the point. So that's the spine of the knife we're looking at now. So the top of the point. And there's our line. So we're just going to slide this on. 
and it should naturally just find the bottom. Right, see we've got a little bit of glue oozing out there, that's brilliant, that's just what we wanted. There you go, so it's just found the bottom of the hole, that's on firm now, and you can see we've just got a tiny little bit of glue oozing out. So I'm just going to use the opposite end of my mixing stick, just scrape that excess off. So the idea is to basically clean it up as much as possible. Yeah, not, you don't have to go mad, it's just, just take off that bit of excess there, perfectly clean enough. And then we can go in with a bit of the kitchen towel and just wipe any extra off the blade. And that's it. Basically, we can wrap the bit of kitchen towel now around the handle and chuck that in the vise just gently and give that 10 minutes to go off. And that's basically the blade handled. Just a little tip, we can see now, this is five minute epoxy and it's already started to go off in this tub or in this little pot. Now, the thing is what I do is I always leave this and they're, they're disposable items. So leave that on the side, come back in 10 minutes and what you should find is all of this glue has gone nice and hard in the bottom of here. If it hasn't, then it's not gonna have set in there either. So what we're gonna do is just leave this basically until we know that it's gone off in the handle because it'll be nice and hard in the pot. So with epoxy resin, that's not a bad little tip. You know if it's gone off in the pot, it's gonna have gone off in the job. So Lee, we're waiting now for this to dry. Yeah, and we can see now that the stuff in the pot, if I, these flexible pots are quite useful, so if I squeeze that a bit, you can see now it's all crusty and hard, the adhesive's gone off properly, and that's been what, not that long. So we know that it's done what it said on the tin. So we can take that out of the vise now. <clears throat> we know the glue's gone off, it's all pretty clean around there, so that's nice. Um, so really now, the only thing to do left, really left to do is to oil it, um, what I will do to begin with is just to fit this little cap. We're going to pl plug that on there and find if we might find if we rotate it a little bit, it binds in. A, yes, it's binding quite well there. It's not going to fall off. But um, just to finish off this end where we've cut it with a saw, I'm just going to take another piece of this masking tape, just so it doesn't fall off as I'm carving. Just wrap that round both pieces, just to basically to secure that to the to the knife handle, just so I can then go round. And once again, that's to give you some length, isn't it? Yeah, just basically it's giving me something. So I'm actually holding the piece that I'm carving, but it'd be very difficult to hold it just with my finger and thumb. So I've got my fingers can wrap round there. I'm just gonna go round, give this a little trim. Just take those facets back again, just to neaten it up a little bit. And then where we've got the saw cut on the end, once I've got these cut back to a nice angle, and I'm just doing this by eye, so it's got a kind of a chamfered top to it. Just again go round and just clean that top face up a little bit. And there we go, that's fairly clean. <clears throat> so then all that remains really, just to give it, make the grain pop a little bit, and give it a little bit of a protective layer is just to give it a quick coat of oil. Um, you could use boiled linseed oil. I'm going to use a bit of raw linseed oil. Um, I'm not going to put it on thick enough that it's going to take so long to dry. So I've just got a bit of a bit of an old paintbrush there. And hopefully you'll see as I brush this on. It's, actually, it's gone a little bit crispy on the brush there. But as I brush this on you should see the colour start to really come out oh, wow. in this wood. They call it lace wood. Now this is always a bit of a confusion when you're talking to people across the pond. We call it London Plain um, and they call it sycamore. Now we don't call it sycamore because we call something else sycamore. It's basically um, Platinus X acefolia is the technical terminology for it. So not to be confused with what we would call sycamore which is, now you're asking, um, what do we call that? It's a pseudo ace or something. I can't remember off the top of my head, but it's different basically. So what we call sycamore is a much whiter wood, very much like ash, but pretty much it's a maple. It's, it's an acer, so it's part of the maple family. And this is something that looks a little bit like sycamore in its growth habits, but you quite often see it planted by roadsides, um, and it has this really pretty 
pretty grain that looks a little bit like lace. If I rotate that a little bit and the light catches it, you can see it. They say basically call it lace wood, but we don't really need to know the technical terminology. So I've just painted that on. I've given it a couple of seconds just to soak in a little bit, and then I'm going to wipe off any excess. So it's sort of dryish to the touch, and that preferably if we leave that out in the sun for best results. But you can see you've got your little your blade there, and that's yeah, pretty much ready to work now. I'd let the oil dry a little bit before I used it, just simply because it'll be a bit slippy in the hand. But so that's got a point where that just kind of wants to lock in place there. So perfect. There you go. So there's your coal roasting knife ready for action. So Lee, we've done the first version. Yeah, really we'll basic, on. simple as it could be. Now the second version. We're looking at, uh, is it a stick tang? Looking yeah, this would, be, this would be considered a stick tang knife, so it's not a full tang, i.e. you're not sticking scales on either side of it. This is going to be st a stick tang or hidden tang. So the fact that we're going to want the handle of the knife to be longer than the tang, it'll be a hidden tang because we won't see any of it. This one will be a through tang, if that's the technical term for it. So it's just an example, we're not going to put a handle this small on it, but you've got a hole that runs all the way through and you could burn that hole through. Then what you're going to do is fit this roll pin like they do at Mora and basically when this is on put the blade in a vise and tap that into place and then peen the end of the tang over. But you're going to have to anneal the tang, i.e. soften it from the heat treat to be able to do that, to be able to peen it. But So that's, that's one method but that's again slightly more complicated. So the easy way to look at this is if we just burn it in to a point where we can then either just if it stays in nicely just leave it in mm -hmm. if it burns in to a nice standard and goes in nice and straight or we can then pull it out and again put a, add a bit of glue just to secure it but what we're going to do is we're going to start with a, a rectangular billet just because it's going to be a little bit easier but if effectively you could this has been sawn out of a piece of wood out of a plank in fact it's fully seasoned there's nothing to stop you using a cleft piece of reasonably fresh this is ash um, so you can see there like we get that section of timber that we want to start with out of this triangular cleft section of of ash which just, can be a bit greener just one quick thing yeah. um, i know this may be an, an obvious answer but nonetheless i will ask um in terms of the woods you're using for for the handles yeah um you you are one of you do want to be focused on the hardwoods is that correct i or? think so yeah i mean you can pretty much make them out of anything they want to have a little bit of str inherent strength yeah um ash is just the generally you know fairly well recognized handle material it's fairly readily available it's good and strong it takes a decent finish off of the tool whether you're sanding it whether you're carving it it's, you know, it's just a, a generally good shock. So it's, 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 this axe, for example, has got an ash handle. It's the best equivalent we've got here to what the Americans would use hickory for. Um, I understand. So that. it's good, strong, it's shock resistant. Snooker cues are often made out of ash. So, it, you know, in terms of an axe handle, it will absorb the, the shock loading that comes from throwing it at big lumps of wood. So, but yeah, almost anything. You know, I've used lots of mm -hmm. other... Generally, I try and stick to... To native stuff, so stuff that grows in the UK is what I normally use, and stuff that I've harvested myself. So maybe um, elm or cherry or apple, you know, whatever's about. Um, it's entirely what you can get your hands on. With this method, there's nothing to stop you doing it from fairly green timber. It doesn't have to be seasoned. This piece I'm using actually is seasoned, um, but there's nothing to stop you using it a bit greener. You, you have to accept that, you know, when you're introducing a lot of heat, there's potential to introduce the odd crack here and there, but chances are. Is going to be fine at this sort of dimensions it should be it should be good so i mean there's different ways to go about this again to, to keep it fairly simple you could use a bandsaw to, to part shape this but we're going to do it all with the hand tools again and um, so you see i've got a couple of templates here that we'll use one is for the side profile of the handle and the other one is for the top profile so the first thing we want to work out really is where the blade's going to sit in this handle and if we think about it, we're going to want, to want it to sit roughly in the centre. So what we're going to do once again is establish, you know, the middle, basically. And in this case, I'm just going to use my finger to give me a guide. You're running that on the side, it's slightly off there, so an extra line. And that's about the middle there. And again, we can measure, measure the tang and we'll find at the end we've got sort of best part of five and a half mil there. If we go corner to corner, which is what really counts, again, just over five and a half. So I'm going to start off with a five and a half mil hole, which is slightly slightly bigger than the tang is in its width. But by the time we get to the root of the blade, there won't be a huge amount of um, 
discrepancy in the width to the height. So first thing I'm going to do again is to drill a hole. So I'm going to take my centre line and I'm just going to run it down one face and down the other face. And I think once again, although I could hand hold, hand hold this, I'm just going to pop it in the vise again and try and use the mirror to guide me. Perhaps we'll have a bit more joy this time if we're lucky in keeping this straight. And this is basically, we're making a pilot hole so that when we're burning the tang in, it's not burning all of the material away. We're actually giving it a weak spot in the wood to kind of find its way. So I could mark it with a gimlet again, but I'm just going to get the point of the drill bit, put it on my centre starting point and just give it a little gentle spin there just to get it started. Check that I'm in alignment that way. And then come over this way and make sure I'm like, and I'm keeping my elbows in. So I'm going to look over, make sure I'm square there. Keep everything nice and straight. Pull the trigger. So we've got the pilot hole in. And this isn't going to go in very far, but it should just give us an indication. And we can hopefully see that looking down there, where's our line? It's reasonably in line with that line and reasonably in line with this one. Obviously it's not all the way in, but it's just giving us an idea that that pilot hole's hopefully running fairly straight. The other thing you can do is use something like a bamboo skewer just to give you an idea whether you're, so it's going all the way into the full depth of the hole. Mm -hmm. Right, it just gives you an idea that you're running reasonably straight. Obviously, there's a little bit of play in this because it's a bit bigger, the hole's a bit bigger than the skewer, but just going to give you a bit of an idea that you're running true enough to then carry on because it can go wrong. It can go wrong when you're burning it in, so it's not the end of the world if it does. You just, you know, if it goes wrong, it's a bit of firewood, isn't it? So we've got that there. We know that that's big enough to start the burning in and we can see that it's already there's not a lot of space around that tang is there so by the time it's burnt into this thicker section of tang we should get quite a neat clean finish so now we're going to use the templates and just like a, a pencil or a marker pen in fact I'll do it on with pen because it will stand out better on the camera I think so if we look this is the side of the handle so the deeper part and we're going to line that up so the center of the template is about in the middle of our centre line there. So for those who are watching that don't have this particular template you're using, um, what guide should they be using to mark out? Well this is going to be a template for, for axing out. So if we look at it, you know, it's basically what you find comfortable in your hand. Some people will find bigger handles or smaller handles comfortable. This is just going to be a fairly generic handle. So it is what, four and three quarter inches long or 120 mil. Um, and it's going to be, we're starting with a billet that's what 37 by 30. Um, and the, the widest part of this, which is going to be an axe template, so it'll end up slightly smaller. So we're, start, we're, get, we're getting down to a dimension of about 30 mil in the, in the height from the side profile. And then the top profile, which will go on here in the narrower dimension, we are down to about 23 mil at the widest point and it obviously tapers a little bit to each end but generally the beauty of doing it like this is obviously when you're shaping this you can keep feeling it and thinking right that's that's enough that fits my hand nicely and at the worst case scenario you can always you know when this blade's fitted you could wrap it up now I want to point out at this stage that this is not a finished blade um, this has still got to be heat treated and ground but it's a blade that I've got available at the moment I haven't actually got anything finished that we can use for this so this is experimental technically because this handle won't be staying on here because this has got to come off to be heat treated so this is effectively scrap anyway but we're doing it for the process so that's the important thing so I'm going to line up my centre line so that I've got an equal amount of the template on each side just pin that down with my fingers and make sure it's looking like it's running yeah so I've got an even amount of waste on either side of it and I'm just going to run a line with a pen here just give me an idea so there's very little point at this stage in drawing that one on because I'm going to be cutting it off mm -hmm. so I always start with the wider one and then we'll move over to the axe block and just try and roughly get rid of most of that waste and chop down to the line
So this is seasoned timber. Um, so it doesn't carve quite as nicely as the green stuff. And you're not going to see the light in here, but I'm going to have to try and work to it. So I've started from the bottom and worked up just to break the fibres down a little bit. And then I'm chasing it from the widest point. So in theory, if the grain's running fairly straight through the handle, from this, the high point here, I'm working downhill, so with the grain. Hopefully in both directions. There'll be occasions when you get bits of wood that the grain isn't quite so cooperative, but this is reasonably straight grained ash, so we're quite lucky there. So again, try and keep your fingers obviously as far away out of the way as you can, but I'm using this finger to back up here and just pinching it with my thing, finger and thumb to keep it stable. And if you notice, I'm not raising the axe really high up, I'm keeping it fairly low. So I'm not in too much danger of cutting my fingers, hopefully. Just come up a little bit higher there. Just so I'm staying working with the grain. And then flip it over and the same in the other direction. Again, if I break those fibres a little bit on the way up, it just means if it does want to tear out a little bit, it should limit how deep it goes into the wood. So you see it's still fairly parallel on the end section, but we've reduced it and given it this kind of cigar shape, if you like, for a fairly basic handle. And we're pretty close to the line. That will do for now, I think. And we're going to be refining this. So that's enough now to add this template. So again, the fact that it's made out of cardboard or anything that you can sort of lay your hands on that's a little bit flexible. Lay it on there. Make sure it's centred on your centre line again. And fairly even amount of waste on both sides. And we're just going to put it down on there. Make sure that's lining up again. And just draw around that once more. It doesn't hurt to have a little bit of extra length. We can either keep that length on the finished handle or we can cut it to length at the end of the job. But if we've got it there for the time being, it's just that little bit extra to hold on to. Being in mind we're working with a fairly short piece of timber anyway. So we're going to get rid of that line now and next down to the line this way. So a bit more to come off of that side. I want to try and get down to the line in one direction to the widest point. You can see the grains running quite straight through there. Hopefully the camera will pick that up. So I know if I'm in the widest part, in theory, I'm working downhill or with the grain and working away from that high spot. So there I might just pick up the grain in the wrong direction. So I'm just using a bit of leverage to make sure that I break those fibres quickly and don't chase a split that runs into the handle. side it's actually easier for me to see the line although the lines facing me when I'm carving this section it's actually far easier to me to see the line that you can see when it's around that way because I'm looking over the top of the blank to, for me to see this line I've actually got to lean back a little bit but I don't really need to see it I've got a rough idea where it is I'll take a bit off then have a quick look there's a bit more that wants to come off Chase that down there, so it's still a bit wide here. So and these dimensions aren't critical, but this will be, bearing in mind we've been talking about more blades that you can buy and the way that the more more handle their blades, this is probably a similar, will end up a similar dimension to the handles that they put on, but it'll be slightly different in as much as it'll be a faceted design. I'm gonna now we can see that we've got really sharp edges, so it's, it's reasonably comfortable in the hand, but obviously the, these sharp edges are going to dig in. Now, more make their handles completely oval 
and smooth, as in sanded smooth, so they're a continuous oval, which I find, although they are an oval, they can be a little bit too smooth and rotate in your hand a little bit as you use them. Whereas with this, it's really sharp and fairly uncomfortable, but it's not going to move around in your hand as you're using the knife. So that's a bonus, but these edges are far too sharp. Right, so we've got the basic shape, top and side profile. Um, now what I'm going to do is just use my finger as a gauge again, and I'm going to do it in pen. I'd usually use a pencil for this, but I'm just going to run a line probably about five millimeters in, and I, I tend to work, so I do one, rotate it quarter of a turn, do another, do another, do another, and then you're back to the beginning. Flip it end to end and do exactly the same thing. So we're basically giving ourselves some, some lines to work to, and what we're going to effectively do is then knock these corners off. So if we're going to call that, we're going to call this section waste here and remove it again. With the axe is probably the most efficient way if you're confident. So we're going to work across that sharp point and cut to the depth where we hit both of our lines, but again just from the widest part of the handle to the end. And we can take the lines completely off really, as long as we don't go too far beyond them. And I'm doing this in the same way, I'm just going to rotate it and work on all of this half of the handle down. And this is this kind of efficiency really, saving flipping it end to end for each facet. Then we flip it and we're working from where we left off, pick up that shaving again, just chase it down to the line roughly both sides. Don't have to be too accurate about this because we're going to refine it with a knife in a second, but it's far easier, especially with this seasoned timber, if your axe is nice and sharp, far easier to remove this material with an axe. So with this particular method you're doing a shaping before we yeah. head in. Now you could, in theory, some people, some knife makers, what they'll do is they'll actually fix the blade into the knife, mm -hmm. and then, or into the handle, sorry, and then tape the blade and put the blade into a, a specialised vice that can rotate and then they'll do all of the shaping of the handle after the blade is fitted. Personally I'd rather do the shaping work before I fit the handle um, because there's, there's less chance, if you're, working, if you're working with rasps and files and sanding something to shape it's not such a big deal, you're not likely to damage your tools on the blade that's already fitted into the handle. If I'm going to be working with edge tools the last thing I want is this blade in place, taped or not, come along with my nice carving knife, slip off the end and clash one edge mm -hmm. with the other because you're just going to ruin, potentially ruin two blades. So to me it makes more sense to do the, the shaping first. So that's now much more comfortable but still obviously a bit rough and, and lumpy in places because it's an axed out shape. So let's move that to one side and grab my knife again. So you can see this is a similar sort of style, it's got the facets on but it's a slightly different shape. But you can see where we're aiming for, basically. This has got my style of handle and this is a bit more generic. So I'm just gonna use this peeling cut here. You see, this is quite a, quite tough timber. Chest lever cut might be a bit more effective at this. So, because I can back it up with these fingers. And what I really, all, all I'm looking to do now is refine these facets. They don't have to be perfectly smooth, but the smoother they are, the more comfortable they're going to be. But a little bit of irregularity is going to give it that bit more purchase in the hand. So you don't have to be overly fussy about this. It's just then a case of, you know, how you want it to look at versus how you want it to feel. It's actually sometimes quite nice if they're a little bit on the rustic side. They lock into your hand that little bit better. And we just want to get rid of these these lines that we've drawn on really and say so normally I'll do this in pencil so there wouldn't be quite so much carving to do to get rid of them but I thought for the benefit of the camera so you can see clearly what I'm doing a trusty marker pen isn't a bad thing to do it with so there's lots of different grips that you can use to do this it's not, there's none of them that are particularly preferable but what I do quite like to do is wherever possible change my knife grips quite regularly because then it means you're not getting set into any particular habit and using any not just one set of muscles in a certain way you are actually varying 
how you're holding things. This is a particular favourite because I can see exactly what I'm doing. It's a short stroke because I'm actually, I'm slightly resisting with this hand. So as I pull in here, I'm driving it with these things, but actually pushing away with this, with this arm. So it's, a, it's the length of travel is only the length that those fingers will move. And I'm not going to slip into myself because I'm not actually pulling the knife. I'm steering with the hand that's holding the knife and providing the power with those fingers and a little twist of the wrist. So I'm, it's very, although it looks quite dangerous, as long as it's executed properly, it's actually quite accurate and reasonably safe. But if it's not a technique that you're familiar with, you know, certainly don't just try removing large amounts of wood with it and putting too much power into it before you're familiar with it and comfortable with it. But as soon as these pen lines are gone, we're basically ready for fitting the blade, so we're not far off at all. The ball has taken off all the lines. Yeah, the lines are pretty much gone now. We've got the shape we're after. You can see it's not dissimilar to a, a kind of a Mora style of handle, which is just a generally fairly comfortable shape in the hand, but with the added benefit of these facets. So we've got the, the slot for the, the hole for the tang is fairly central. Just take a little bit more off the bottom here. And then I'm just going to clean up these corners again just by taking these off just to soften these edges a bit because you might choke up on the knife and don't want these sharp corners kind of digging in your hand but more importantly I'm going to do the same on the on the tail end because if we end up having to strike this with the mallet to knock it onto the blade what we don't want to do is to hit a corner and to split the wood so if we just take a chamfer off of each face around about 45 degrees, it means that when we do strike it, or if we have to strike it, we might get away without having to, but if we do strike it, we've got no chance of actually hitting the corners and, and splitting, the, splitting the wood, it should all go on. So we're just going to strike that face now, that flat face. And that's, you know, it's as good as a finished hand. As you can see, that hasn't taken long to do that, to get that to that sort of state. And it's perfectly comfortable, it will do its job in a range of grips. So now it's time to, to get the tang warm and burn it in. So we're outside now. Yeah, um, we've come outside so we don't smoke the workshop out too much. And also apologies about the background noise. Uh, we are in a suburban area, so. Indeed, in the heart of the ghetto. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, <laughs> no. Um, I'm gonna put this blade in a, in a metal vise and I wanna, have it so that the blade is in the vise but obviously the tang's not and just to reiterate this isn't a finished blade but part of the reason for clamping it in a metal vise if this was a finished blade and it was heat treated tempered etc we'd probably be putting a bit of tape on this edge just to protect us and the edge we might also just got a lay, lay a wet towel across that but just the mass of this vise being metal and cool should mean that we're only going to heat this end portion of the tang to burn it in and the heat shouldn't creep too far up. Hopefully, because we've got this kind of ground surface, we should see exactly as we heat it, the heat creeping up the, up the handle. So I'm going to use one of these kind of plumber's torches. Um, you want to be able to direct the heat. You don't want to be chucking this whole thing in a fire because the whole blade's going to get hot, which would spoil the, the temper of the edge. So. I want to be able to just direct this heat to the end inch. Now you could technically, if you've got a forge or a fire, you could very carefully be introducing it and pulling it out and just checking and maybe wrap this in a, in a wet towel just so it's going to stay cool. But we want to keep the heat local. So let's just fire this up. Just keep it on the end. The end's just starting to glow red now. So that's a good time. You just pop this in and see the heat. You see all the smoke coming out the hole. So that's starting to burn its way in. But I don't want it to get stuck, so I'm going to take it off now and reheat. The 
can see there the temper colours just creeping. As long as that yellow colour doesn't travel into the blade we'll be fine. So again we're nice and hot. A little bit of a wiggle. Keep pushing, you might need to give it a tap. And I'm just gonna get that off while we still can. Because what you should find is that this will, as this is burning on, obviously it's burning some of the wood away inside, but it's also gonna be sticking it to the to the metal effectively. So that'll probably still smoke a little bit, but that's sort of cooled down to the point where it's not actually burning the wood anymore, and it's not gonna go on much further than that. But what we can see, if we just clean that back, you can see these, these colours here. So they're the temper colours. Now as long as that yellowy colour doesn't creep into the edge here, this is still cool to the touch. This hasn't got warm at all, because it's in the body of the vice, which is quite cool. Um, I wouldn't want to touch this end because that's still going to be really hot, but I can afford to chase that a little bit further. As long as that doesn't come, like I say, I want to keep it probably a centimetre or so away from the actual edge itself, but we're going to go for another heat, and hopefully now with this, this heat, it should just, it should just go on. this time because hopefully it'll be the last time. Just put a foot on that. So there we go. That handle's now fitted. You can see there's a little bit of sap coming out of the wood. But that blade's still cold to the touch. I don't have to worry that I've lost the temper in it because I wouldn't be able to pinch it for this long if I had. <laughs> that would get so hot. So it's reasonably straight. It's sitting in line that way. Still smoking a little bit, but again, it's not. It's still not hot to the touch. So that hasn't travelled. At this point, we could actually just put just put that in water to make sure that the heat doesn't creep down into the blade. But if you can touch it, it's not too hot. You know. To lose that temper, it's going to get up to 200 degrees, which you're going to know straight away. <laughs> if you could, you know, so I've held on to that the whole time. It's not really getting any hotter, so the temperature's not creeping. But say, so now would be a good time to actually put it back in the vise and just let it cool down in situ, basically. And this would now stick, basically. That's it. I, you'd have a job pulling that off now. I mean, I'm going to because it's not a finished blade. Right. So I might just burn the handle off because it's got to be heat treated yet. I might knock it off, I might split it off with a chisel, but it's not, unfortunately, because this isn't a finished blade, it's not a finished job. But you can see, you can get the idea of where we're going with that. It's gone in all the way, it's pretty neat. All right, you've got a little bit of dark colour where we've burnt it in, but you could take something like a Stanley knife or some sandpaper and just clean up that front face there. But that's about, I mean, be able to tell from the video but it doesn't take long you can see it's fairly quick you can shape the wood you can fit it and you can effectively you could be using the knife right now if it had an edge on it I could pick up a bit of wood and start shaving with it and it's it's a job done you were just quickly saying something off camera and I thought it was important to get it on camera yeah, yeah. about the temper yeah firstly we've well, basically we've knocked this handle off now um, so in theory I could keep this and when this blade is heat treated I could refit this because I know it's a tight fit and it went in really well but you can see here can we see these colours mm -hmm. this has gone all dark this is still bright where it's ground and then we've got this kind of rainbow effect in here these are what's called your temper colours so as the steel gets to a certain temperature it will display a certain colour now if we had any problems in this yellow colour more importantly the blue colour the yellow or the goldy colour is actually a good temper. That's what you'll do to heat, fully heat treat the blade is temper it back to this kind of goldy bronze colour. If you were to sharpen it and get it too hot on a linisher belt, 
then it would go blue and then you've taken that heat treat out you've just ruined it basically so but we can see we're comfortably we've got a good inch of tang that hasn't got too hot so we know that that blade is still good and actually now this has cooled down to the point where I can touch all of it um, but yeah so if, if need be now I could keep this handle finish cleaning it up a little bit heat treat this blade and sharpen it and then know that I can just basically put a drop of glue in there bash that back on and it's a you know as good as a perfect fit as you're ever going to get so I can see why for you know for centuries this was probably the the way most knives were handled. And so in terms of the glue, would it be the same principle as what we showed earlier? With, with the, yeah, uh... just put some epoxy in the hole, wait for it to settle a little bit, and then just push the blade in, and hopefully, if you've judged the amount of epoxy right, like we did earlier, you won't have too much of it blooming out the top of the hole, but you will have some that just comes out, so you know that the hole's in completely full of glue and, and tang. So there's no actual air space in there for it to cause a problem and come loose later. So, but that's, yeah. that's, that's the principle of that technique. Unfortunately, say it's not a job that we can leave as finished because this has got to be heat treated, but it shows you the idea. So there you go, guys. That is a wrap for this video. I know it's a long video, but as you can see from the content that you've just seen, it was necessary to show all the steps involved. So, Lee, thank you so much. You're all welcome, Zed. It's the first time I've seen it in person and you finally solved that mystery for me. Yeah. I was like, as you attach the handles to these knives. Um, like I, we mentioned in the beginning of this video, um, there are a lot of different techniques you can deploy uh, to attach handles to knife blanks, especially the stick tank knife blanks that you've just seen. And so I just want to stress that this is what Lee does. So, you know, there might be people out there watching that do it slightly differently. It's kind of each to their own. You know, everyone has their own nuances. But this is what Lee does. Lee does it quite successfully. I can, it's be safe to say you do a lot of tools as well, don't you? Yeah, and say so, to be honest, re very rarely do I do the burning in method. Yeah. But it's a useful one to know, and as you can see, it's not overly complicated. It can go wrong. Yeah. But the investment in time in making the handles fairly fairly quick, so if it does go wrong, you've not really wasted much time or material. So, yeah, it's not a bad way of going about it, is it? And the thing is, this we intentionally done it in a way where. Because obviously if you want to do it really professionally then obviously you've got to use a lot of equipment like a bandsaw behind us and a drill press and a whole bunch of tools and, a, and even a lathe. Um, but we try to do this in a way and I think Lee has done a fantastic job in trying to use the minimal tools possible um, in order to kind of get this done. So you essentially have two options available to you that you have been outlined in this video. So obviously you choose which one uh, you feel may be best for you. I think maybe the gluing one. Yeah, It'll probably be the um, easier Certainly one. Certainly a bit safer. There's no flames yeah. involved, so it's not a bad place to start. And then having a slightly oversized hole, as long as you're not too fussy about seeing a bit of glue around the yeah. edge of the hole, yeah, it's fine. Yeah. So it's what I do most of the time. It's just the more experience you get, the neater you'll make the hole in the first place. So it. You fancy you make your handles. Yes, that's indeed, it. Yeah. But it's still really good, the ones that you turned out. Um, so like I said, you've seen two techniques. I hope they helped. Uh, I know there's a lot of you out there that have been wondering, like me, how you do that. So hopefully this video is giving you some guidelines how to go out there and practice yourself. And like we always say with all of these tutorials and any of the information that we give on this channel and elsewhere, is obviously be safe you know, when you're doing this. You know, Take precautions. Um, you are dealing with sharps at the end of the day and obviously they can buy it. So once again, Lee, thank you so much for taking the time out. You're welcome, Zed. Thank you. What I'm going to do is I'm going to put a link below to Lee's Instagram profile which is pretty much where he's most active he posts some incredible content photos videos live feeds I know you do some live yeah things okay you? you want to get time I quite enjoy live yeah feeds. Good carving. they're really good you don't know, have quite... to edit them <laughs> <laughs> that's it not like my dodgy editing so um, he does some incredible stuff on Instagram so needless to say I'm going to put a link below to his Instagram it will mean the world to me if you go and check that out I'm also going to put a link to Lee's website you can find out more about the work he does the tools that he does and the spoons he carves uh, he's a very talented guy you can see a lot more on his website about everything that he gets up to once again it will mean the world to me you go and check that out to find out more information about lee so hope you enjoyed this video be sure to subscribe if you're not subscribed already please leave a uh, comment below if you've got any feedback or you've got any opinions on the video that you've seen wish you the best of luck in your endeavors in trying to attach a handle to your knife blanks and once again lee thank you so much and as always, I hope whatever you're doing, you have a blessed day, a blessed week ahead. From Lee and myself, Z Outdoors, peace out.